Um, we were talking last time about R versus S, and I had started to tell you the story of Nexium, the purple pill, along with its Enantio pure, no, Prilosec, along with its Enantio pure uh, cousin, uh, Nexium. So I'm just going to copy these structures to facilitate our discussion. All right, so shown up here at the top, molecule A is uh, the S isomer. Uh, don't worry about assigning stereo centers at sulfurs. That's not important for what we want to talk about. And then the R enantiomer is pictured below, and this was initially marketed and sold as a one-to-one -one mixture of enantiomers, or aracimate. Now, uh, companies do this because it's easier and cheaper, and you get to test two different molecules for the price of one. Um, but, as I said, when the patent expires and other companies can start making the drug and selling it, they compete with you on price, and the price falls, and, and this is why... Uh, when you go to the doctor, you ask, is a generic version of that pill available? And it's often cheaper and the company loses money. And so what they will try to do in many cases is uh, develop a process for purifying one enantiomer, uh, the, the enantiomer that is most active, uh, and marketing it to you as a new drug. It's called the chiral switch. And this is what they did with Nexium or S. omeprazole. And to this day, you can go to Costco and you can see side by side omeprazole and S. omeprazole. You can buy either the racemate or the pure uh, enantiomer. Uh, uh, Colton, you're asking how can they be enantiomers when there's no stereogenic center? Yeah, it turns out a sulfur, this sulfur is bonded to three things, but also has a lone pair that occupies a specific position and doesn't really invert. And so in this isolated case, sulfur can be a stereo center. You just have to accept it as, uh, as, uh, as shown. And I won't ask you to assign stereochemistry there. So uh, you can still buy both of these at Costco, but imagine that... Uh, you're a physician about the time that uh, this chiral switch happens. And imagine a sales rep comes to you and says, hey, um, I know that you now have the ability to prescribe omeprazole generic and it'll be cheaper for your patients. But actually what you really want to do is you want to prescribe this more expensive but pure enantiomer because it's pure. It's no longer a one-to-one -one mixture of, of enantiomers. It's just the one thing and purer is better, right? And in fact, 150 milligrams of Nexium, they might say, and I don't know whether this is actual data, but they could argue this, uh, can do what 100 milligrams of omeprazole or Prilosec could do. All right, so how do you reason your way through that? Um, first of all, you gotta understand a little bit of biology and that biology is chiral and that chiral molecules can detect differences in other chiral molecules. We got a little bit farther in the one o'clock class than we did, I think, in this class last time. So we talked about handshakes right and left hand. Did we do that in this class last time? Don't think we got there. Okay, so at some point in your future, you're going to have an interview. Perhaps your dreams have come true. You've paid your primary and secondary application fees to med schools or dental schools, and you got yourself some interviews, and you go, and the interviewer offers her right hand because this is no longer in the COVID pandemic and we handshake still, I don't know. And, and you present your right hand, firm handshake, sit down, have a great interview. Right hand, right hand, handshake. Feels natural, right? Uh, what if upon offering her, your, uh, her right hand, you provide your left? Is that a different situation? Yeah, it's kind of more of a, what am I supposed to do? Give kiss? Am I supposed to kiss your hand or something like that? A right hand clasping a right hand is different from a right hand clasping a left hand. Okay, Right 
right hand clasp is a diastereomer of right left hand clasp and they feel different and you can recognize the difference. And biology is the same way. The biomolecules that make us who we are, many of them are chiral. They have stereocenters and therefore they're just like your right hand. They can discern between one enantiomer and the other. Uh, in fact, I want to show you an example of this. We're going to come back to the story of Prilosec versus Nexium. <clears throat> but I want to demonstrate that the same molecule, biomolecule can recognize uh, two different enantiomers. Oh, how about that? There's Larry. Uh, I'm sorry. We do, I don't know if we talked about uh, Bob the tomato and Larry the cucumber and the pirates who don't do anything, but somehow my children have a picture of that in the pictures here. That's weird. All right, I don't want that one. I want these three add. Okay. So um, the particular example is not important here, uh, but let's see. Sorry, I need to move the images around. Okay, so we have here a protein that binds an inhibitor. And what the protein is and what the inhibitor is, it doesn't matter. I just found it uh, in the literature and made this image from uh, data that, is, that are available in the protein data bank. This molecule in orange has one stereocenter, and the stereocenter is right there. And I want to circle it, I guess, in pink. That's the stereocenter, all right? Uh, and I forget whether one is R, I mean, one is R and the other is S, but um, I'm not sure which is which. In other, in, <clears throat> but this molecule occupies a position in the active site of this enzyme. And the dotted lines indicate perhaps hydrogen bonds between groups, electronegative groups on the molecule and NH bonds uh, on, uh, on, the, on the protein or OH bonds, these dots are water molecules. Uh, so the, the inhibitor fits in the enzyme active site uh, very precisely. Now the other enantiomer, uh, the stereocenter, everything else in the molecule is the same except for the stereocenter. Um, up top, the proton was coming out to our right. Here on the bottom, the proton's coming out to our left. Uh, so this is the other enantiomer, and you can see that it fits in a different way into the active site. It looks like the blue nitrogen on this uh, molecule wants to hydrogen bond with this carboxylic acid group. And that's still the case down here, uh, but the rest of the molecule's pointing in an, in an entirely different direction. Uh, so these two uh, structures are uh, the complex of the R enantiomer with the protein versus the S enantiomer with the protein. Even though uh, these complexes are not covalently bonded to each other, you can think of them as though they were. They are diastereomers or diastereomeric complexes and they have different shapes different properties uh, different extent of filling the active site different number of water molecules in the active site you can overlay the two and you can see very clearly how uh, the orange enantiomer and the purple enantiomer occupy entirely different spots of the enzyme active site and you can see how that could translate into different function. One enantiomer might uh, bind to a receptor really well. The other enantiomer might not. They might both bind to the receptor pretty well, but one might have uh, an effect downstream that's different from, from the other. So the basic principle is two enantiomers don't have to do the same thing in biological contexts. And there's, there's plenty of examples of this. There are molecules that are enantiomers that actually smell differently. Why is that? Because your nose is chiral and can sense molecules that are enantiomers differently. Um, so coming back to our discussion of omeprazole versus its pure S enantiomer, 
Presumably they tested this one-to-one -one mixture so that they knew that giving, it, giving both to you was safe and wasn't going to kill you. So assume that there aren't any horrible side effects. Uh, let's imagine a situation in which the A uh, in antium or the S in antium or whatever it is um, was the active one and B was just dead weight. Didn't do anything, all right? Then what do you think of this, what the sales rep told you, that 50 milligrams of the pure enantiomer is just as good as 100 milligrams of the racemate? What do you think? Impressive? No? Seeing some head shakes? No? Why not? What do you think? Go ahead. So the, the, yeah, the question is, would it, would it not matter because you only have so many enzymes that the drug can bind to? Yes, okay, let's assume that we're giving it in a dose that doesn't saturate, I guess, all your enzymes. But those of you that were shaking your heads, the 100 milligrams of the one-to-one -one mixture is actually only 50 milligrams of the active compound, right? If we're assuming that the S in antiomer is active and the B and the R in antiomer isn't, okay? So maybe it's not at all impressive to you that 50 milligrams of Nexium work just as well as 100 milligrams of Prilosec. Maybe that's, maybe that's a boring so what, okay? Um, what about this situation? This happens actually a lot with, with drugs. What if they told you that it's better to take the pure enantiomer, but you find out later on what if you find out later on that there's a biological process that once you take the pure enantiomer actually converts it back and forth and you get a one-to-one -one mixture anyway? Then it's just expensive nonsense, right? Um, so there are a lot of things to consider when dealing with uh, drugs that have stereocenters and are either in a racemic mixture or an antiopure, and there's it's a case-by-case -case basis, and the only general principle you can use is that biology, because it's chiral, doesn't have to react the same to both enantiomers. It, it might. It might react the same, or one might be active and the other might be dead and not do anything, or one might have a good effect and the other might have a bad effect. Uh, the classic horrific story of, uh, of enantiomer trouble in, uh, in medicine is the story of the molecule thalidomide. And uh, this is the correct enantiomer is an anti-emetic drug. That means it stops you from throwing up. It was prescribed for morning sickness. Um, when I said the words throwing up, I was about to go tell you some horror stories of throwing up among my children. We've got all kinds of words for throwing up in the Price family. My favorite is hork, because it actually sounds like throwing up. The littlest guy, Adam, he's now nine, so he's not little anymore, but he was a barfer. And there was one time we were sitting by, I decided to tell you the gross story anyway. There was one time we were sitting around the Christmas tree doing our annual pizza by the Christmas tree tradition and Adam gags on something Kid has his crazy gag reflex and starts to look like he's gonna throw up. He's too little or too preoccupied to run to the bathroom. So I pick him up and I start to spin to head to the bathroom and he cuts loose while I'm spinning. <laughs> and it was quite impressive and some of the other brothers were like, wow, next time I'm gonna do the spin barf. All these things you have to look forward to. Anyway, thalidomide is this anti-emetic drug but it's stereoisomer, uh, and I'm just gonna copy this. It's stereoisomer in which the nitrogen is up instead of down is a teratogen. That means it causes uh, uh, mutations and developmental problems in, the, in, a, in a fetus. So, 
um, you would want to only take the correct enantiomer. The problem was that uh, for reasons you'll discuss in 352, this proton here is very acidic, fairly acidic, more acidic than your uh, typical CH bond, and can be removed, and once it's removed, you go through a planar intermediate that can get protonated from either side. And so even if you take the pure enantiomer, you're going to have a mixture of the desired enantiomer and the teratogen because they equilibrate under biological conditions. So, um, those of you who anticipate careers in medicine someday are going to need to be thinking sensibly about enantiomers and stereochemistry and to view uh, with some skepticism what pharmaceutical sales reps uh, tell you. The end of the story with omeprazole and esomeprazole was that there basically wasn't a difference uh, unless you happen to have a mutation in a certain liver enzyme that helps metabolize the drug once you take it, and in that case, the pure enantiomer might be slightly better than the racemic mixture, but not enough to make a difference, and you can still get both drugs today, and I don't know why you'd pay one for the other. Actually, I think word's gotten out, and so now the prices have stabilized, and uh, omeprazole and its pure enantiomer both cost about the same because they have the same effect and demand is about the same. All right, um, so I think that's it as far as that story is concerned. Um, we need to say, anything else you wanna say about diastereomers in biology? Yeah. Question, so how do they switch? Like you said, on the biological process of how they, one goes from one enantiomer to another. How does it switch? Yeah, so in biology, a base from an enzyme can come and remove this proton. And when that happens, you go through an intermediate that is basically sp3 hybridized and trigonal planar at this carbon. And then it can get protonated from above or below either side. And so you generate a one-to-one -one mixture of enantiomers at that point. And, and there are a number of drugs that are this way, not, not all of them, but in this specific case, even if you gave the pure enantiomer, it would become a mixture of both enantiomers in, uh, in a short amount of time. Okay, so uh, one last thing in stereochemistry that we should talk about is that there is another way to tell enantiomers from each other and so we're going to introduce an analytical tool called optical rotation. Um, and the basic idea here is that uh, chiral molecules interact, two enantiomers interact differently with plane polarized light. There's some physics here that I don't understand and so will not attempt to explain to you. Um, I could attempt, but then it would just make things worse. So uh, first we need to talk about polarized light. Um, you guys have used polarized glasses before to prevent glare. Uh, if you've ever taken one lens and the other and held them at 90 degrees and it blocks out a lot of the light. Uh, polarizers make it so that all the photons getting through a polarizing lens uh, have their uh, electromagnetic fields oscillating in the same direction. Um, and when you do that, and, and often we'll represent, so polarizer, light of various kinds goes through and, and all of the photons that come through are now um, oscillating, their EM fields are oscillating in the same direction. So we're gonna represent polarized light that way. And then if you, if you make that polarized light pass through a chiral sample, by the time it gets through the chiral sample, the direction of oscillation will have rotated. And uh, you can actually measure that angle of rotation. You can take where it used to be 
and where it is now, and you can measure that angle of rotation, which there we're going to call alpha. Alpha is the called optical rotation, and it's measured in degrees. And uh, it can tell you something about how much of one enantiomer versus another you have present, okay? So um, I'm not going to draw the molecule cholesterol, but you've heard of it before. And uh, I'm gonna tell you that if you have a pure sample of cholesterol and you pass polarized light through it, uh, the, the pure sample of cholesterol will rotate that polarized light by positive 32 degrees. So clockwise versus counterclockwise. I forget which is plus and which is minus, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't matter. So, and, and in antiomerically pure cholesterol, that means only cholesterol, not its enantiomer, okay? Now, if you could uh, prepare a sample of enantium, the enantio, enantiomer of cholesterol, we'll just call it enantiocholesterol. I feel like we're doing some brother of Jared things here, the cholesterol and the enantiomer of cholesterol. Enantiomer even sounds like moriancomer a little bit. So, <laughs> moriancomer cholesterol, mo, I don't know, enantiocholesterol. It turns out if you know the optical rotation of the pure of one pure enantiomer, you by definition know the optical rotation of the other enantiomer. In other words, regular cholesterol rotates by plus 32 degrees, enantio cholesterol rotates by minus 32 degrees. And this is kind of cool. They have equal in magnitude, but opposite effects on the optical rotation that you observe. And uh, the other cool thing, and the question from home is, do all uh, enantiomers rotate light? Chiral molecules uh, should rotate light by some amount. Uh, the amount that they rotate light varies widely. I will point out that the direction of rotation, plus or minus, has absolutely nothing to do with the identities of the stereo centers, there is no correlation between R or S and rotating clockwise versus counterclockwise. And it's difficult, and there may be some physics that allows you to predict it, but I don't know what it is. You take one pure enantiomer and you measure its optical rotation, and then you take the other and you measure its optical rotation, and they have to be the same, but opposite in direction. The other interesting thing is that the amount of rotation is additive. And what this means is uh, if I have, say, a mixture of uh, enantiomerically pure cholesterol and it's, if I have a mixture of regular cholesterol and it's enantiomer, suppose I have 75% regular cholesterol and 25% enantio cholesterol then the amount of rotation I observe is just 75% times plus 32 degrees plus 25% times minus 32 degrees. Or in other words, now math, uh, 24 minus eight, that close? <laughs> equals 16 degrees. All right, so what that tells you is if you have a mixture of two enantiomers and you measure the optical rotation, you can learn something about how much of one enantiomer you have. First, the sign of the rotation tells you which is the major enantiomer. Positive rotation here, positive rotation there. Therefore, uh, regular cholesterol is the major enantiomer in this mixture. 
Now, the magnitude of the number you observe tells you about the solution composition. And um, there are a couple of different ways to reason through this. Uh, you can use algebra with two equations or two unknowns, or you can sort of just feel your way through it qualitatively. I'll try to show you uh, both ways. So let's say that I observe uh, optical rotation equals minus 24. Three dot, oh, somebody's saying, what do three dots mean? Um, it's not some weird Lord of the Rings dot or I or whatever. It's, uh, it means therefore in, I can't remember where I learned it. It must have been in Mr. Schott's math class when we were doing proofs. Sorry. Uh, so let's suppose for a mixture of cholesterol and it's an antimer, we observe an optical rotation of minus 24. So we'd say this mixture has uh, X percent cholesterol and then one minus X, 100 minus X percent in antio cholesterol because the mixture only contains either cholesterol or it's an antimer. Does that make sense so far? And we know that uh, pure cholesterol should rotate light by minus 32 degrees, no, plus 32 degrees, whereas in antio cholesterol should rotate light if it were pure by minus 32 degrees and we set all of that equal to what we observe, minus 24. Now we just do the algebra and we figure out what x equals. But who wants to do that? I don't really want to do that. And so that's one way you can do it. The alternative is to take the observed optical rotation of plus 16 and divide it by, oh, Sorry, we said it was minus 24, didn't we? I'm thinking way ahead. Take the observed optical rotation of minus 24 and divide it by the uh, rotation of the pure major enantiomer. By the way, what is the pure major enantiomer? If it's minus, if we observe minus 24, which one is the major one, cholesterol or enantiocholesterol? In Antio, so minus 32, okay, that looks like uh, divided by eight, three fourths, 75%. And 75% uh, of what? 75% enantiomeric excess. That means we have 75% more of in antio cholesterol than cholesterol. Or, <clears throat> if X is the amount of cholesterol and Y is the amount of in antio cholesterol, y minus x equals 75 and x plus y equals 100 and you come to the conclusion that y has to equal 82 right no what am i thinking 25 divided by 2 is 12 75 plus 12 is 87 and a half and x equals 12 and a half percent. All right, is that clear as mud? <laughs> the way to think of it that's easiest is this. You take your observed rotation, you divide it by the rotation of the pure major in antiomer, and then the number you get out, 75%, tells you that 75% of your mixture rotates 
light and 25% of your mixture uh, does not because that 25% is a one-to-one -one mixture of enantiomers, a one-to-one -one racemate. So the composition of your mixture must be 75% enantiocholesterol plus 12.5% enantiocholesterol plus 12.5% regular cholesterol. So that's another way to go through it. Go ahead. Where did I get the Y and X from? By solving these two equations. The other way, if you don't want to do that and you want to just think through it, take your observed rotation, divide it by the rotation of the ma pure major enantiomer, and then that number tells you how much more of one enantiomer you have than another. And the remainder the remaining 25% that's left over is a one-to-one -one mixture of both enantiomers. Okay, so this is tough to do and tough to explain. I think I've done a fairly bad job of it. Um, it's worth just a little bit of practice, but it's not worth worrying about too much. I will say this, if you have a 50-50 mixture of enantiomers, uh, plus 32 for cholesterol and minus 32 for an anti-cholesterol. That leads to zero degrees or no rotation at all. So if you have a one-to-one -one mixture of enantiomers, there's no rotation at all. Okay, that's why we say if you have seven, if you observe 70 percent, 75 percent of the expected rotation. That means the other 25 doesn't rotate at all because it's a one-to-one -one mixture and they cancel each other out. All right, I don't feel like I've done that good of a job explaining that, but I also don't know that it's worth a huge amount of effort. Uh, so what questions do you have uh, on that before we move on? Yeah? What specifically does X and Y represent? Here, Y is the percent of the major enantiomer, and X is the percent of the minor enantiomer. X and Y have to equal 100%, and the difference between X and Y is 75%. So you put those two things together, and you will get these answers out. Others? Yeah? For the real life setting, do they have like some sort of spectrum? Yeah, yeah, so upstairs on the fourth floor at the end of the hallway, we've got a polarimeter, which basically has a polarizer on either end and a space for a chiral sample, and you shoot light through it and you, you can measure the angle of rotation. And so for people that are in an organic lab and making molecules that are chiral, if it's a new molecule and you, ha and you want to demonstrate that you've made it uh, and how pure it is, you have to measure the optical rotation and compare it to a standard, and then that can tell you how pure it is. Others? So, I mean, why did we just spend 10 minutes on this thing that isn't that important? Uh, because it shows up. It's an easy question for people to ask you on MCAT and DAD. It shows up in various places as a way that, to assess whether or not you can think about stereochemistry. So I thought I'd introduce it here. Um, I regret doing so, but on the other hand, it, it has a chance of being useful to you in the future. So, yeah. Will that ratio of enantiomers always be one-to-one? Will the ratio of enantiomers, what do you mean, always be one-to-one -one or? In the 25% that's left over, yeah, it will always be one-to-one. -one. So whatever your enantiomeric excess is, what's left over is one-to-one, -one. yeah. And if you remember that, you can do the math without having to do all the math. <laughs> okay, good, what else? All right, well, it's about time to start thinking about reactions. We've gone long enough not talking about reactions. 
So chapter six provides some background into why reactions happen and how reactions happen. Uh, and so there are two sort of main concepts that we want to get. One is thermodynamics. That's basically the why reactions happen. And then the other is kinetics, which is how. All right. Um, so just a brief review from things in general chemistry for reactions that are spontaneous, delta G is negative for reactions that are downhill. Uh, another way of saying this is delta G equals minus RT natural log of equilibrium constant. So if your equilibrium constant is greater than one, meaning you favor products, delta G has to be negative. The other thing that you get from general chemistry is that free energy equals change in enthalpy minus T times temperature times change in entropy. This is making some of you feel sick at home, I think. <laughs> Oh, no, actually, I'm misreading the chat. Uh, Wallace, that's kind of silly on my part. I don't understand, actually, the lingo today. Apparently, the word sick, as used by my children and some of you, means good. So, okay. How embarrassing. <laughs> but the thermodynamics may make you feel ill. Maybe we'll just use ill for... From now on, nobody say I'm feeling sick today. It should be I'm ill. No. But then people will just start using ill for really cool. Man, dude, that's ill. Um, lit is the other one. My children say the word lit, which I'm not sure. My oldest son tells me that's a contraction of legit, which is itself a contraction of legitimate. I don't know. So weird. Maybe you guys can help me with this at some point. Delta H is change in enthalpy. And uh, enthalpy is something that I didn't feel like I understood after general chemistry or even after organic chemistry. For our purposes, we're going to think of enthalpy as changes in enthalpy as related to the strength of bonds or uh, and this is just an aside because we won't come back to this in 351, uh, and or the strength of a non-covalent interaction like a hydrogen bond. So um, one reason why reactions happen is because the bonds you form are stronger than the bonds you break. Delta H is negative when the bonds that you form are stronger than the bonds you break. And that is a driving force for why reactions happen. Because you get to rearrange the bonds into a more stable arrangement. Delta S is entropy, change in entropy. And uh, this relates to disorder or the number of uh, ways a system can be configured. And for the most part in chemistry, we're going to assume that the change in entropy is small. There are a couple of situations where the change in entropy might not be small. Um, and it's good to be aware of them, though I can't point to any particular situation where being aware would uh, cause an answer to be different. But if you go from, um, if you go from one product to two products, one starting material to two products, you're splitting something in two, that automatically increases the disorder, and so the change in, in entropy might not be small. 
Uh, also, if, you, uh, if one of your products is a gas, like uh, CO2 or nitrogen, gases have way more entropy than liquids or solids do. And then the third situation is if you make a ring, you constrain two things that used to be free and now they're attached together. Uh, that can be a, a non-trivial change in entropy. As I said, it's good to be just generally aware of those ideas. I cannot point to a question I might ask where knowing that would make a difference. Uh, but if you're going to ignore something, you just as well also know situations in which you, you should not ignore it. So uh, for our explaining how reactions, why reactions happen, we're going to focus on enthalpy. And we can uh, sort of predict what the delta H change for a reaction should be uh, by looking at things called uh, bond dissociation enthalpies. Now these are numbers from a table in the back of your book. You can, it, some will be presented in chapter six and some will be in um, appendix A. Bond dissociation enthalpies describe how much energy it takes to go from having the two electrons shared equally to having each partner in that bond have only one of the electrons from that bond and for them to be separated at infinite distance. Uh, by the way, to a first approximation, this is the same number as that we get when we mix the two 1s orbitals together uh, to get a sigma bond for hydrogen and the bond dissociation enthalpy is this energy difference. Um, so for hydrogen, I can't remember what the exact uh, number is, but I think it's around like 100, maybe 105 kilocalories per mole. Your text will use kilojoules. I don't care. It's fine to use kilojoules, but I prefer kcals for tradition. So it takes that much energy to break the bond. Um, now you can use this uh, information for various molecules to get a sense for whether a reaction is uh, thermodynamically favorable or not. Uh, as an example, this may not be a particularly good example. Then why are we doing it? Eh. We'll take this alkyl halide and mix it with a strong base. And we'll make a new oxygen-hydrogen bond and a new carbon-carbon pi bond. And uh, we'll have Br minus over here. So, we can do a couple of things to see whether, to, to compare whether we think this reaction is gonna be downhill in energy or uphill in energy. Uh, the first we already know how to do is to compare the stability of the negatively charged things on either side, right? Which do you think is more stable, the negatively charged oxygen or the negatively charged bromine? bromine and you know that because Br minus is the conjugate base of HBr whose pKa is like minus 9 and uh, the alcohol, uh, I'm sorry, the negatively charged oxygen is the conjugate base of an acid whose pKa uh, you would normally say is 16. It actually happens for this particular alcohol that oxygen is especially reactive and the pKa happens to be 19. Not anything for you to memorize, but yeah, just based on stability of the negatively charged thing alone, you've got, oh, 28 orders of magnitude difference 
in stability. Okay. Uh, so that gives you a sense for how, how much more stable the negatively charged things on either side are. Now let's compare bonds broken versus bonds formed. Uh, it looks like over here we break a hyd carbon-hydrogen bond uh, between a carbon, a sigma bond uh, between a sp3 hybridized carbon and a hydrogen. And uh, we can go to the table uh, at the, in the text or at the, uh, in the appendix and sort of figure out that bond association enthalpy is around 90 kilocalories per mole for that carbon-hydrogen bond. All right, we need to pause there, but uh, in your, all of your spare time before next time, I want you to look up bond dissociation enthalpies for the carbon bromine bond, for an oxygen hydrogen bond, and for a carbon carbon pi bond. And see whether you can make a comparison.